Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Jennifer, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study. And you can see I am not in my normal spot. I am up here at a cabin in Arrowhead with some girlfriends of mine. <laughs> and uh, they might be coming down for their morning coffee in just a minute. But until then, it's just us. And normally, also, I'm able to get us going live on Facebook, but we had some challenges getting the live connection to work. So you are watching or listening to the recording, and I'm really glad you're here. We are wrapping up almost our lesson uh, two, uh, going through Ephesians chapter two. It's been a great lesson, hasn't it? I've been loving it. Well, today is day nine of lesson two, and this is probably my favorite connection point of the entire chapter. I don't know. I probably could say that for every every chunk that we've gone through but uh it's it's going to be a really great lesson today so i'm glad you're here and joining in whether you're listening or you're on the youtube uh channel watching or on facebook later i'll put this up on facebook when i get a chance um so if either way wherever you guys are connecting with me thank you for being here let's go ahead and grab our bibles and uh get into some time of prayer and then we'll jump into our bible study let's pray Heavenly Father, thank you once again for our time together in your word. What a great reminder your word always is that you are sovereign, that no matter what's going on in our life, that we could turn to you uh, for wisdom and guidance and comfort and uh, just um, just the, the anchor that we need in our life. So thank you for that. And thank you for the word this morning that we're about to get into. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's do it. Got my coffee, got my great cabin. I, I wish you could see the view. Actually, let me let me see if I can do this. I turn the camera around without completely messing it up and making you feel dizzy. Here's our gray cabin, the stairs upstairs, kitchen, turn it around without getting too dizzy, and the view. And the lights are kind of, there we go. <laughs> the lights are kind of shining on the window. You can't see it too well, but it's great. And honestly, right outside through those trees is like Arrowhead. Oh my God. The new sounds from being away from home. Um, the wood floor up, up here, let me, you can see that up there. See the great wood floor. That is the ceiling and the floor to the upstairs. So whatever, whatever they do upstairs, I hear really loudly down here. I don't know if you guys heard that, but I did. Kind of jumped me a little bit. I think someone dropped their hairbrush upstairs. So hopefully that's all it was. <laughs> all right, got my coffee. Mm -mm -mm. So let's get into the word. And oh, let me go ahead and hit the share screen so we can read through our chapter here. I don't have my normal setup, uh, which gives me some good lights at, at home. Um, and so that's kind of reflecting on my glasses and stuff. But hey, it's rustic, right? We're in the woods together today. Let me open that up so you can see a little bit more as we're reading along. All right. All right. So today we're going to be reading from, and if you go over here, you'll see. Um, you'll see the link in the online uh, Bible study. But if you click that link, it'll take you to Bible Gateway, like always. But today, we're going to read out of a translation. My guess is most of you are fairly unfamiliar with. I've quoted from it before. It was a translation that um, I grew up with. My dad um, introduced it to our church and our family growing up, written by a scholar named J.B. Phillips. And he only translated the New Testament. I believe he did portions of the old, but he wrote it in modern English for the day. I believe it's, he was also British, so you can kind of sense a little bit of that. But if you see on the page there, you'll see that the, the Bible verses are grouped together. So he's taking the concept of that and rewriting it. And I enjoy his style of paraphrasing. So I should clarify this as a paraphrase today and not an actual thought for thought uh, or word for word translation. It's it's what it's a, literally a, a paraphrase, kind of like the Message Bible or the Voice or any of those other good ones. All right, so let's read today out of the J. B. Phillips paraphrase. To you who were spiritually dead all the time that you drifted along on the stream of this world's ideas of living and obeyed its unseen ruler who is still operating in those who do not respond to the truth of God, to you Christ has given life. We all lived like that in the past and followed the impulses and imaginations of our evil nature, being in fact under the wrath of God by nature like everyone else. But even though we were dead in our sins, God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, gave us life together with Christ. It is, remember, by grace and not by achievement that you are saved and has lifted us up 
and has lifted us right out of the old life to take our place with him in Christ in the heavens. Thus, he shows for all time the tremendous generosity of the grace and kindness he has expressed toward us in Christ Jesus. It was nothing you could or uh, did achieve. It was God's gift to you. And no one can pride himself upon earning the love of God. The fact is that uh, what we are, we owe to the hand of God upon us. We are born afresh in Christ and born to do those good deeds which God planned for us to do. Do not lose sight of the fact that you were born Gentiles, known by those whose bodies were circumcised as the uncircumcised. You were without Christ. You were utter strangers to God's chosen community, the Jews, and you had no knowledge or right to the promised agreements. You had nothing to look forward to and no God to whom you could turn. Oh, I love the way that is worded. But now, through the blood of Christ, you who were once outside the pale, <laughs> Isn't that a great turn of phrase? You who were once outside the pale are with us inside the circle of God's love and purpose. For Christ is our living peace. He has made a unity of the conflicting elements of Jew and Gentile by breaking down the barrier that lay between us. By his sacrifice, he removed the hostility of the law with all its commandments and rules and made in himself out of the two, Jew and Gentile, one new man, thus producing peace. For he reconciled both to God by the sacrifice of one body on the cross, and by this act made utterly irrelevant the antagonism between them. Then he came and told both you who were far off from God and us who were near that the war was over. Oh, I love that too, that the war was over. And it is through him that the both of us can now approach the Father in one in the one spirit. So you are no longer outsiders or aliens, but fellow citizens with every other Christian. You belong now to the household of God, firmly beneath you in the foundation, God's messengers, and prophets, the actual foundation stone being Jesus Christ himself. In him, each separate piece of the building, properly fitting into its neighbor, growing uh, grows together into a temple consecrated to God. You are all part of this building in which God himself lives by his spirit. I could read that right again. I could read that right now, right over again. That was so good. And you just don't hear that phrase, um, outside the pale there. <laughs> That's a great British phrase. And I knew, I recognize that it's British because you can see down here, neighbor with the O-U-R ending. So it, I was I was right. He, he is a British writer. Okay, let's hop over to the lesson itself. And good morning. <laughs> I know you're trying to slip in. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and back over to the lesson. Grab your lesson page. We are on page 23 of the lesson. And, um, oh, let's review our verse. We didn't review our actual memory verse. Back up there. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God planned, prepared beforehand. <laughs> that we should walk in them, which God prepared beforehand, which we which we should walk in. My goodness, I wish I was in third grade again. It's third grade, I could memorize like crazy. Man, I get those stickers every week and put them on my, my memory you know, board over at church or at school or whatever. Good times. All right, get some coffee down my gullet here. Hold on. I'm giving you a chance to write, by the way. So go ahead and, <laughs> go ahead and um, get that going. All right, back over to the lesson. All right, your verse, Ephesians 2.10. And let's take a look at Ephesians 2.17. 2, uh, to whom did he, Jesus, preach? And let me hop over to the Bible page that I have. That. All right. So Ephesians 2.17. To whom did Jesus preach? To those who were far off and those who were near. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to, the, <laughs> peace to those who were near and who were far off. Well, the Gentiles, Gentiles were the far off ones and who were near the Jews. The Jews were the ones who God had chosen. Remember, we went back into that lesson when we talked about Abraham and how God selected Abraham, made a covenant with Abraham, sealed that covenant. And um, from that point forward, actually, even before that, because covenants were made with Adam and covenants were made with Noah and covenants were made. Who's the next covenant after Noah? I'm forgetting one. Somebody write it in. Tell me who the next covenant was. I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. Anyway, point being, God makes covenants, but it was through um, Abraham that he honed that in to a specific people and said, I'm going to make 
out of you that great nation if you go back to lesson i think seven um we talked about that that great nation uh, i will bless those who bless you curse those who curse you okay those are all the near people those are the ones that were in that covenant relationship with god now anybody could become part of that covenant if they um you know adopted the the jewish ways back then if they became part of that and got circumcised and obeyed the laws and became all part of that um, but now he's saying everybody else who was far off it's open to everybody now you don't have to get circumcised you don't have to go through the the ordinances that he's broken down all right let's take a look at luke um we're going to do luke 4 and um 15 to 22 and 43 to 44 click over to that and I want you to think as we're reading these two passages, um, what is Jesus doing and who is he doing there to, and how it relates back to this passage here in, in Ephesians. So he came to Nazareth and, let me back up, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, when, where he had been brought up, Jesus' hometown, right? And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Wouldn't that have been an amazing moment to be there in this scroll? I mean, we have the scrolls now, but they're, you know, old and decrepit and falling apart. Wouldn't that be amazing if we could been there when that was scroll was opened? fresh. All right. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. He read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He set me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? <laughs> like he's reading this and he's saying, it's been fulfilled now. And he's speaking with power and he's speaking with authority. And they're like, wow, right? Isn't he just Joseph's son? So moving forward, and I know I'm jumping through. If you want to read all of chapter four, I encourage you to do that to get better context. But I want you to get he's he's in the synagogue and he's teaching to the jews and then he says in verse 43 but he said to them i must preach the good news of the kingdom of god to the other towns as well for i was sent for this purpose and he was preaching in the synagogues of judea so he's saying look i'm sent to get this word out and he's going to go through the synagogues and <laughs> i'm getting something on my tooth i'm going to go through the synagogues and get this word out that's what i why i was sent how does this relate to Ephesians 2.17. Well, he has been preaching to those who are near, all right, and, and getting ready to get that message out further. Read John 4. I didn't, I think I meant to write John 4.40 40 to 42. Let's go check. I, isn't that funny? Look, at I wrote it down funny over here too. Oh, it's 4, 4 to 42. Yeah, it's a long passage. That's right. Oh, let's go ahead and go over to John, and I did not link it for you, so let me just copy and paste. But this is this is why I love this lesson. It's going to be awesome. Get over to here and get that scripture typed in for you. I hope I, I hope I wrote that down right. All right, and oh yeah, and he had to pass to through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, uh, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Uh, go back. I think we're just going to answer a quick question. Uh, what is Jesus doing, and to whom? So, um, well, he's going through Samaria, and he's sitting by this well. Okay. We'll answer it longer in just a second. Let me go ahead and finish reading. <laughs> a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me as a woman from, of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that it was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? Mm. And I could, man, we could just, honestly, we could just park it right here, do the whole Bible lesson on this, which we're going to do a little bit of in a minute. 
He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him from um, will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. And we talked about Christ, meaning the word Messiah. He who was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. People like to say Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Uh, 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 read this verse. I am, he says. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is re receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that, that sower and reaper may rejoice together. Here, For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor, others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay and he stayed there two days. And many more believed of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard it for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. Powerful moment here preaching those to those who are far off and those who were near. Check this out. Now, consider the Samaritan woman's encounter with Christ as you reread Ephesians chapter two. Note on the left how Paul talks about how we once were and on the right make parallels to her story and her encounter with Christ. There are, there are many parallels in this, these two passages. So list as many as you can see. So let's go back through Ephesians two, um, one through 22 and parallel that with John four. 42. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get Ephesians up and close this down. There we go. Okay, so I can't get both of those, I don't think, on the same screen that you would be able to see at the same time. So I'm just going to read it through um, and remind us as we kind of, as we go through all of this together, um, some of the parallels that, parallels that we're seeing. All right, so uh, Jesus goes to Samaria and he's um, engages with this woman. This woman is a Samaritan woman and um, and uh, outside uh, in um, well Samaria, and <laughs> and uh, this is not an area that uh, Jews would normally be engaging a woman, let alone you know a Samaritan woman. All right. So Ephesians two one through twenty two we read, "You're dead in your trespasses and sins, following the course of this world." That woman was following the course of this world. She was with five husbands and the one she was with wasn't even her husband. So there's a, a parallel following the course of the world. Um, and then I want to continue on with kind of like a her state before she meets Christ Jesus. Um, she, I'm going to slide down here over to Ephesians two. Oh, that sun is like coming in and poking me in the eyeballs. <laughs> All right. Um, she's, you were far off. Um, you were un, part of the uncircumcision. Um, she needed to be reconciled. 
um, she, there was a hostility. Um, she would be considered strangers and aliens, um, not a saint, not a member of God's household. All right, all of that we're seeing in that passage in parallel. So as a Samaritan woman, she's that's the parallel there. You know, she's far off. She's um, she doesn't have the living water. She doesn't have that. And Jesus is making that connection point there of, of these two worlds, bringing them together in this moment. Then Jesus spoke. <laughs> this will move right behind a tree leaf in just a minute. Um, for now, I'm just listening. If you're seeing me on the video, those of you who are listening, you could just imagine a halo over my head. I know. I know. It's hard to imagine. Hold on. Let me get some coffee. All right, when Jesus spoke to a Samaritan and a woman no less, he was exemplifying the very reason he came, that the good news was for all, Jew first, Gentile, and everyone, man and woman, slave and free, rich and poor, everyone. The Samaritans were a race of people utterly hated by the Jews. A Samaritan woman would have been even more despised since she was by the Jews, seen by the Jews as having no access to or rights to their God. She was even looked down upon by her own people. Coming to the well alone tells us this. Wells were community locations where women would have gathered to chat and socialize, but she clearly was not wanted or accepted. She was a Samaritan, a woman, and an immoral woman at that. Her story illustrates the truth of Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. While she was still dead in her sins, a child of wrath, far from God, separated and alienated, and a stranger and without God, Jesus was drawing near to her, abolishing the law that labeled her unclean. Wow right? All right. So what truth from Ephesians 2, 14 to 19 is Jesus demonstrating in his encounter with the woman at the well? Consider also Matthew 5, 43. Let's go ahead and hop over to that. We'll give it time to dial in. You have heard it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you... What more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And I'm um, over in Ephesians 4, uh, 2, 14 to 19. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments, a commandment that would have set aside her as unclean right, that Samaritan woman, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the other, uh, in place of the two, so making peace, and he might reconcile us both to God. This is Jesus in the flesh doing that exact thing, reconciling her to God, literally, really, um, and in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility, and he came and he preached peace to you who were far off, her, and those two were near. And that takes us back to that passage in Luke 4 where he's in the synagogue and he's saying, I can, I'm fulfilling this right now. I'm here um, preaching the good news to the poor and the alien and the downtrodden and getting it out there. His quote from Isaiah. And then he went and he did it. He preached the good news. All right. Um, so illustrate Ephesians 2.18, especially as it relates to God in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and how Jews and Gentiles can now both have peace with one another and God. That's Ephesians 2.18, um, which is, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. You know what I picture when I read, it, when I read that? I picture the cross. And I picture the, the arms of the cross extending those who are far off and those who are near and that Jesus brings them together and unites them in, in him. And uh, I, I see like the, the center point of that cross, like, the, like a, the swirl of the imagery in my mind of the Holy Spirit, bringing them through together and then God at, at the head. And you can almost picture a Trinitarian view on there with God and Jesus extending his arms out and then the Holy Spirit in dwelling us. Isn't that powerful? That's how I picture it in my mind. Take a, take a minute to uh, jot your own illustration to that maybe Maybe that'll help you get a, a visual in your mind as well. All right, complete the following as it relates to Paul's analogy in Ephesians 2, 19 to 21. All right, so we who were in Christ were, are members of the household of God. And the household was built upon what? Well, the apostles and the prophets. 
and uh, the cornerstone of that household yeah good answer you know that Jesus and that whole structure now does what in verse 21 it grows together in a whole as a holy temple into a holy temple peace ah sweet peace in what ways do you see the true peace of God revealed in our passage today with God well, it says that we're reconciled to God. We were, there was a hostile relationship between us and God. We were children of wrath, which means destined for the wrath of God, heading in that direction, all right? And peace with one another. Why? Because there's no Jew, there's no Gentile. We both have access through one spirit. So how does knowing that you're a dwelling place for God by the spirit impact how you'll walk in good works that are prepared for you today? So we're going to look back at Ephesians 2, 22 and 10, and then also consider 1 Corinthians um, 1, uh, 6, 19. I'm going to go ahead and slide down, sorry, so you can see that better, and uh, hit that into the scripture. All right, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. We are the temple of God, the dwelling place for his spirit, created to do good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to do in Christ Jesus, right? Those are the good works. How does that impact my walk? Well, as I'm moving throughout my day, I'm I should be mindful of that. I should be living with that truth ever present in my mind that I'm a moving temple of God in a sense and I'm connected to other believers that we unite together to become that temple of God. All right, well, let me call, close with this reflection and also a reminder. Let me get that called up here. All right, reflection. Solomon wisely observed there was nothing new under the sun, and although he wasn't referring to a lack of unity in the culture around him, he could have been. Disunity is as old as Eden. There always has and always will be the battle between the us's and the them's. But God brings all things and all people together in Christ. Far off, Christ brings near. Separated, Christ unites. At war, Christ is the peace. Aliens, citizens of a true kingdom because of Christ. Where should all this be found? the church as a whole, and us as individual believers. We are the dwelling place for God by the Spirit. When you feel anything but peace and unity, go back to God. Circle back the truth. Circle back to the truth that he created us to do good works, that we were created before the foundation of the world. These good works that only happen when we are united, not in some hippy dippy kumbaya campfire nonsense, but in the resurrection power of Jesus who conquered death and gave us all the hope of the power of true unity. That's the good news. That's a great message. What a powerful way to end this chapter as a, a reminder for all of us as we're coming together to live out that actual truth, to really have that present in our mind. And I hope that you will do that today. And I hope that any time that you feel a, a sense of disconnection or not having peace or feeling far off and feeling distant from God, my goodness, that sun is just, it's just being filtered through these leaves. Those of you who are listening can't see that, but it's filtering through and coming through the room right now. So, so, so pretty. Anyway, great reminder for us this morning. Amen? All right. Hey, another reminder. Uh, tomorrow is, or the uh, next day we get together, actually hop back over to that and show you. The next time you do your lesson will be um, uh, lesson 10, or day 10 of lesson two. That's our create and share day. And I typically don't jump online and do those with you. That will be, um, if you're if you're marching on the routine of, of the lessons and doing them each day, then you will be in, uh, that will be Monday morning. And again, I don't typically do those with you. Um, I might jump in and, and share that with you, just kind of walk you through some ideas. But um, in case I don't decide to do that, I wanted to just remind you of that, that it's our Create and Share Day and really cool. Um, we are gonna, we're gonna share you know, what God did. God made us his poems, his masterpiece, and we're image bearers of God. In other words, we act out and be imitators of him. And so we're gonna be poem makers, masterpiece makers as well. And I'm going to give you some prompts on how to do that. I might just do it on Monday with you. Anyway, I just wanted to read it ahead <laughs> and uh, get you thinking about that. All right. 
God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. I know I will. I'll be up in the mountains with a bunch of girlfriends of mine and um, going and enjoying his beauty and his creation and the beauty and creation of the friends that I'm with and the fellowship that we have together. And whatever you're doing, why don't you send me a message? Drop, drop it down in the comments there. Let me know what you're up to today and what you're doing. Maybe show me a picture of your day. I'd love to see that. And then I look forward to seeing your creations also. Don't forget, it's always nice to be able to see those online. If you share them, make sure you tag me um, or along with uh, Church Women's Ministry, LMCC Women. All right. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I look forward to being with you in person at Bible study on Monday night or Tuesday morning. God bless you guys. See you soon. Bye-bye for now.